I want to thank you very much for joining us for Morning Coffee. Today we're going to have a conversation about a project that Kimberly and I did with Elaine Korn called We Are Where We Eat. And We Are Where We Eat is really the story of place, that where we grow, cook, sell, and uh, eat the food that we have really defines who we are as a people and as a city and as a region. We are one of the most diverse count, uh, cities and counties in the country, and we were from the very beginning of the gold rush. So I'm joined by two friends today, Kimberly Graham, who is part of the We Are, we Are, uh, we Are Where We Eat project, and author and um, journalist Joan Didion. And you might think that it's odd to have Joan Didion here. We had hoped to have one of the new uh, immigrants that we're really talking about that have opened up so many cafes and bakeries and butcher shops around Sacramento, but we didn't realize that most of them are mom and pops and they're busy. They literally couldn't get away from business. We did, however, for those of you in the studio audience, stop by Broadway Donut Shop, which has been owned by the same uh, Chinese family for over 38 years. Uh, so I'm gonna give a shout out to Minka from there as well. We uh, hope that you enjoy this substitution and uh, our different way of telling the story. But first, we have to give a word from our sponsors. We are here on behalf of both the ACC, Senior Services, and also the Renaissance Society of Sacramento. We had close to 85 people from Renaissance sign up for this and are watching, we hope, on Zoom. So thank you very much. And now I want to introduce Kimberly. Kimberly and I met a little over 10 years, uh, probably 10 or 12 years yeah. ago, through the Sacramento Public Library, we were doing a project called the I Street Press, where we could get people's stories, memoirs, novels, books, whatever, uh, and be able to print them on demand. And I was also at the same time working with Elaine Korn, 
who's the, uh, uh, she was a former editor of the Sacramento Bee at the time she was with Capital Public Radio. And we wrote a grant to Cal Humanities to capture the stories of people in this region that were involved in some aspect of food, agriculture, agricultural transportation. So Elaine ended up recording about 12 stories that you can still hear on Capital Public Radio. And then Kimberly and Isaac Gonzalez and James Scott, I also realize, who most of you have been seeing from the Sacramento Room, did about, what, another 90? Yes, something like that. Or so. And Kimberly and I have continued this kind of through the, the years. I also want to introduce you to author Joan Didion. And I was first introduced to Joan Didion, I don't know if others were. When I was 18 years old, I thought I was gonna be a music major and drama person at Sac State. That kind of didn't work out. And I took a class from Bill Dorman and he said, handed me a book, like maybe second week of class called Slouching Towards Bethlehem. And it was a class on what was then called new journalism. And what was different about new journalism that Joan Didion, uh, along with Tom Wolfe and a few others, really kind of uncovered was that you wrote a story in, with the, to complete journalistic integrity, but that you use some of the elements of fiction to really make those stories uh, come alive. And Joan Didion really amplified more than anyone a, a sense of place, both the stories that she told about Sacramento and also the stories that she did almost everywhere um, else. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly. Kimberly, can you introduce yourself? To reiterate, again, my name is Kimberly Graham, and I'm a native Californian, born and raised in Oakland, California. And I uh, come from a litter. I am one of seven, number six, in fact. I'm the second daughter, separated by a 16-year gap and four brothers. And my parents, um, so I have southern roots. My parents are from northern Louisiana. And they're both college graduates. And my dad settled here in the 1950s, mid-1950s. And my mom came later in 1960. And they're both excellent cooks, um, which is how I kind of got my start at one point in my life. And the, um, for my parents, their exposure also became our exposure. So we were encouraged to experiment with food, explore food, experience food. And we had dining experiences as early as five years of age. And ultimately, though, my parents were like, try it once, at least once before poo-pooing it. So. <laughs> Great. And uh, Joan, so I, I have to tell you that we have very different uh, backgrounds. I grew up in Sacramento in uh, what we called the projects then. It was New Helvetia. Uh, I, they've changed the name often. And it was pretty mixed culturally. So there was probably 20% Chinese, 20% Japanese, uh, Hispanic, uh, Latino, um, and then black. And even whites weren't necessarily considered white at the time because it was Portuguese and Italians and mm. ethnic groups that um, were still marginalized, I have to say. And you grew up really, and you're gonna be talking about this, in Sacramento's landed gentry. Um, you delve deeply into your family roots in your books. The first was a, a book that, uh, I should admit, I've never liked your first book, Joan. It's called <laughs> Run River, and it's about a Sacramento pioneer family that's really falling apart. Uh, and even though I thought that you captured Sacramento really well, it do, did show a kind of dour, negative thing. And, and I was kind of more of a Sacramento rah-rah. Uh, <laughs> but you also, and you talk about a family that's seething with racism uh, and fear of new immigrants to uh, later books that I did love, Where I Was From, which really is uh, evocative of Sacramento, South and West, which is from a notebook to the year of magical thinking in which you tell the story of your husband and daughter's uh, death and the evolution there. One of the quotes, this is the only time I'm gonna quote you. You quote, new people could be seen, seen by people like my grandfather as indifferent to everything that had made California work. But the ambiguity was this, new people were also who were making California rich. And so I'd like to ask if you can, um, would you like to say a few words about why sense of place and food and immigration 
and migration is so important in your writing. Sure. I was born in Sacramento in 1934. My parents lived on 23rd Street. As you mentioned, my family traveled west with the Donna Reed party. Fortunately, they parted ways before tragedy befell the nation's, <coughs> excuse me, most notorious cannibalistic clan. I really know nothing about Elizabeth Scott Harden. She was my great-great-grandmother, but I do have a recipe for cornbread and Indian relish, Indian relish. Her granddaughter brought these recipes over in 1847. She also brought a potato masher, some seeds for corn, peas, beans. You know, they ended up and a hill ranch near uh, Florence. They were raising grain and had cattle, had 12 cows, made and sold butter, eggs, chickens, once in a while a calf. They would drive to Sacramento once a week to sell. You know, my father did the churning of the butter. My grandmother, she did the milking. Years later, when she lived with, with us, she would uh, walk to Bon Marche on Y Street and buy a cracked crab for dinner, and then she'd take a taxi home. You know, they entered the state at a moment in its history with racial policies that were shifted from the Spanish colonization to American statehood. And all the gold, although the gold rush brought immigrants from all over the world, the settlement of California actually was premised on the imposed racial hierarchies. You could see that in our on our farms. There was Mexican, Chinese, Filipino, Japanese. You know, they were separated not only by how they were housed, but by their language, by their culture, and by the food that they ate. Thank you. So when I moved to Poverty Ridge in 1982, I was delighted to know that I lived in walking distance, literally about a half a block in one instance and another block to two of the houses that you lived in in Poverty Ridge. Um, and I was just wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about the Sacramento was like in the 1950s when you were growing up. I talked a little bit about what it was like for me in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Well, we moved around a lot before and after World War II and finally settling a little while in 2211 U Street and eventually the home of my step-grandmother on 22nd and T. Huh. Period antiques all over that house. And the dining room was peppered with this Tiffany velvet, you know, the olive green cloth but on the walls. But it was, um, that's the way it was in those days. You know, it's hard to imagine as a teenager in my first years at Sacramento City College that we still had working farms and dairies. At 21st and T was the Cox Farm. A little further down the street was the Buffalo Brewery, California Winery. On Broadway, there were dozens of places to eat where our, my friends could meet. Harvey's Hamburgers at 11th and Broadway, Soda Fountain at Tower, Drugstore, Shasta Ice Cream, Fulton's Cottage Cheese, Toffinelli's Ravioli. Oh, man, were they good. <laughs> We'd walk to A&W Root Beer across from the cannery. There would be the Alhambra Grill. Boulevard, Rosemont Grill, the Ham, uh, Robert's Fish Grotto, Hart's Cafe, or get some ice cream at Ogie's, Pharmacy in Japantown, Eat in Chinatown, and occasionally Mexican, but it was kind of the slummy part down by the river. I am keenly aware of where I'm from. And my writing reflects it. You know, a place belongs forever to whom claims it the hardest, remembers it the most, obsessively, wrenches it from itself, shapes it, renders it, so radically that he actually remakes it in his own image. And that's what I've always tried to do in my writing. <laughs> well, as for food, you'd think I wouldn't eat it all. I never weighed more than 95 pounds. But I love to cook and eat and entertain. I learned the fine meaning of repeated rituals of domestic life, setting the table, lighting the candles, building a fire, cooking. All those souffles, 
daubs and gumbos. Now, we had to have clean sheets, clean towels, hurricane lamps for the storms, enough water and food to see through whatever geological event would come our way. These fragments I have shored against my ruins were the words that came to my mind. These fragments mattered to me. I believed in them. We've gotten a sense of what, Cal of what Sacramento was like for Didion in the 50s, Mary Ellen. But what was your Sacramento like? And how have you been or seen it evolve over the years? So one of the things that I loved about growing up in my particular neighborhood is you knew where you were by the smells. So uh, in New Helvetia, if you were near uh, uh, Mrs. Friedis's house, you really smelled this, uh, the saffron, the things that came from Portugal. Mm -hmm. Our next door neighbors were the G's. They had a wonderful shop at 13th and W. And they would cook Chinese food for us all the time. But my favorite memory was one year, so it must have been 54, 55, when we had the flooding, their supermarket, their market, wasn't supermarket, it was a little tiny thing, flooded, and they had sugar smacks. I don't know if those in the audience remember sugar smacks, and they congealed. And so they handed them out to everyone so that we could uh, eat them. The other thing that I loved in our neighborhood is we were at the American Poultry Company, and you would go and watch, I would love to go and watch the uh, mostly Chinese women who would go up and they would pick a live chicken and they could choose whether they were going to kill it themselves or have the uh, owner do it. And they would pluck the feathers on the way home. And I always felt like in magic, you know, you could follow the feathers on the way home. <laughs> we were close to the produce market that was on Fifth and Broadway. And that was a produce market that had what's still my favorite uh, uh, store or, or restaurant ever, the Market Club. But the farmer's market was set up because it was impossible for Japanese, Chinese, Portuguese, some of the other uh, ethnic groups that I talked about, to be able to be in the other farmer's market. So they set up a special market there. And Elaine talked about this uh, later. Broadway, she called it around the world in 30 blocks. Broadway was incredible. And you could actually, when I was a kid, see people go from the boats at what is, uh, Oh, we have, we have people here who live that way. It's Miller Park, I guess it was. Uh, they would go from boats from there and then actually on carts, take those carts directly down the river. So our life seemed to be Southside Park, Portuguese butchers, all of that. And then some of the places that you um, mentioned that you went to occurred later. Uh, and our favorite restaurant was Ding Hao, which was on the corner of 28th and Broadway. So that's a little bit about my Sacramento. So, <clears throat> um. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> See, I get to talking and forget. <laughs> Kimberly. <laughs> so, I, uh, uh, and I didn't really um, uh, uh, talk about the evolution yet, but what was the evolution in your own background? Because you grew up in uh, Oakland. Was it similar to what we experienced in your decades below us? So I'm probably not that 15 far. years behind not Joan that Didion. Far. Yes, not that far. <laughs> um, in short, yes. Um, I grew up, we were the third black family in a predominantly white neighborhood, but it was also, I would say, sprinkled. We had a uh, I remember living next to uh, Puerto Rican neighbors who would make homemade tamales, mm. and um, we'd get them in plantains. So, well, we'd get the plantains, but we'd also get them in the banana leaves. So they didn't do the traditional corn husk, um, and that was something that I enjoyed as a, a young child. But it wasn't uncommon for us to have nightly family meals that were prepared fresh and hot. My family believed in that since we raised a lot of our own food or preserved it or, or canned it, giving their roots in the South. And that was something that they did to in order to ensure that they had food. <clears throat> the only exception would be um, both of them worked full-time jobs. So we'd have what we called a free-for-all. And it was a Friday or Saturday night off where my parents didn't cook and we were allowed to have actually fast food um, and or takeout. So food was delivered back then. This was long before DoorDash and Postmates and all that sort of stuff. And it was actually pretty good. <clears throat> um, 
But some of our friends had the same food fair over and over. But my mother, being the culinary and whimsical person that she was, we had a plethora of different foods. So there was no shortage of variety that came into the kitchen. And that, we, again, we were encouraged to try and expand our food vocabularies. Um, but, you know, having traveled since I was seven, I, I remember getting on a plane at seven, and my first destination was the South. But we would take road trips, and we were always encouraged to stop and try something. So you do the Southwestern trip where you get a lot of Indian fare, Native American fare, basically, and you get fry bread and things like that, which was one of my favorites. Um, as I got older, my evolutionary exposure changed, having traveled to Jamaica, the Bahamas, even, I know it's still part of the, the contiguous states, but Hawaii has its own food fair and a whole different plethora of Polynesian you know, integration. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, um, I've been to Australia where that's a whole other mind-blowing experience, especially if you've ever been to uh, Linden Street. And then ultimately South, uh, South Africa, where I've gotten exposure to different um, types of culinary cuisines and um, sort of, but now that I live in Amador County, it would startle some people to know that there's more than American fare there. Um, there's a huge Asian population, and when I say Asian, we have um, East Indian foods. Um, I, there's actually a boba place that opened up recently, and people frequent, which I love boba teas. I got introduced to them in 2008, and it's kind of one of my go-tos when I do have um, Asian fare. Um, but basically, you know, representation from around the globe. Great. Well, I'm, I'm just going to add on to that. One of the things that, uh, uh, when I was a kid growing up, I, I might mention that I thought that vegetables came in cans <laughs> because that's what we had. And you would go to the supermarket and you could get maybe broccoli and cauliflower that was cooked for 30 minutes. It would be like mush. The only time you got fresh vegetables was going to eat Chinese, at least for when I was a kid, um, you know, growing up. But my father, you are where you eat, and it's not just geographic location, it's eating um, in the kitchen. So there was a year that my father bought four, okay, so it was four gross. Gross is 144. Mm -hmm. Four gross, so that's 144 times four cans of Chungking oh. chow mein. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the legacy that he uh, left. So I was <laughs> delighted. When, you know, later in uh, Sacramento, and we, we moved to a, another neighborhood that was heavily Portuguese and uh, Italian, but the growth in Sacramento of, I'm gonna call them corridors, starting, you know, Little Saigon, uh, that's really, you know, evolutionary uh, kind of, you know, food. We didn't have Thai food. When I was a kid growing up, you could eat Chinese. The first sushi that I remember was probably was 1967 or so. Um, uh, you, you would get it, by the way, at the Oban um, Festival. And my parents' best friends were the Okinos. And George Okino, who was the produce manager at Cordy's, would do a wonderful uh, Japanese New Year's. So you would be able to get it in someone's houses, but you wouldn't actually get it in a restaurant. The rickshaw, which is on 10th Street, and that's the place that was really evolutionary for me. Um, and we could have a whole program on the problems with redevelopment. Japantown, Chinatown being destroyed, the black community, the Hispanic community, literally in West End. But for a lot of Japanese and Chinese, they moved close to us on 10th Street. And so there were wonderful places that you could eat, the Wakana Uro, um, the Moki place was always there. But I remember going to the rickshaw when I was a, a high school person, or maybe the first year of college, and they only served sushi on Fridays for lunch for like three hours, and you had to get there before the sushi was uh, gone. Now we have all these different neighborhoods, so I, and I like eating streets. So um, obviously we have Stockton Boulevard, which is Mexican and Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, you can kind of name it. Freeport Boulevard is another street that you can just, you know, multiple cultures in a street. Broadway would be another one. Uh, we talked about that, where just such a variety of of restaurants and tastes. Um, so now we get Thai food. I just had Laotian and Cambodian food for the, the first time. 
Indians. So to me, Sacramento has really evolved neighborhood by neighborhood, street by street, block by block. So yeah, having gotten back to Sacramento and the geographic locations that we've been talking about and the different neighborhoods that you expounded on more um, and the reflection of the food that we grew up with or cooked or savored. Um, so you and I worked on We Are Where We Eat together, um, collecting stories from around the, the county but did any of these stories stand out to you, or were there any surprises? Yeah, uh, uh, lots of them. So uh, Kimberly and I had the great fortune of getting to just meet people like us. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Joan Didion, for being a, a celebrity author. But those aren't the people that we interviewed. And we were, <laughs> and we were oh, well. able to go through the entire county. So we would be in Walnut Grove and Locke. Portland, Isleton, Orangeville, Antelope. Uh, Antelope. Yeah. I mean, just almost everywhere. And every place you had, people would come and they would give us, tell their stories that surrounded by food. We were shocked at how many people had somebody in the family who had been either a farmer or a chef or a, a cook. There, um, we, we found out that one in eight people had worked at McDonald's. That was one of the, <laughs> was one of the real shock. But, some stories stood out a lot more, and we're going to be talking about another project that we're going to do that we're hoping will be filmed here called Voices of the Delta. And I met Nicholas Gonzalez, and he was a Portuguese um, asparagus picker. When I met him, he was 93 years old, and he talked about the stoop labor that he would do in the picks. That's the one, the, the one um, vegetable that there has never been any mechaniz mm -hmm. mechanized mm -hmm. form. And so his story was pretty incredible. And then the story of his wife, and up to that point, one of the stories that he shared is that each one of the farms would have their own check wagons. The, the, uh, oftentimes the wife of the farmer would produce the food. And then at some point the labor organizer said that was too hard on the families. And so his wife started the first taco truck. Oh, wow. And we were able to, uh, literally one of the first taco trucks, still one of the best places to eat, I have to say. Um, you know, uh, around. And then the other thing that um, uh, we discovered was in our neighborhood, where Joan Didion and I were. Oh, thank you. So uh, uh, in our neighborhood, how many of the people in our neighborhood, because we did do a program at McClatchy Library, were Japanese that had been um, working in the, the homes of people in Poverty Ridge? that were interned. So we heard more internment stories, I have to say, than we ever wanted to mm -hmm. uh, hear. And then we would go to the Renegade Market, and that was one of my favorite places. And I don't know if anybody's heard about the Renegade Market. It's what we call. You know, there's the big market at 6. It was under the freeway, 6th and um, X Street, with all the organic. And then on 5th Street, across from the old Hong Kong restaurant, was this Southeast Asian Asian restaurant that we call the Renegade Market. And what I loved is people were making tofu. Mm. Uh, and so I got in uh, how to do that, where they were getting their fruits and vegetables. So each one of those stories were really important to me. And then how about you, Kimberly? Because you, you were part of I that I got to project. interview them. So uh, <laughs> it was uh, sort of an impromptu thing that it was before I knew it, hey, I need you to interview these people and find out. So for me, the diversity of where people came from just within Sacramento County, because there's so many districts, if you will, or you know, little areas that are notably named for what, what was there before and people remembered those growing up, um, sharing you know, their childhood stories and when we would demonstrate actually at some of these events, there would be a resonation for people saying, oh yeah, my mom made this and was similar to what you made or we did it like this and, and that, just that diversity of, you could have a commonality of a food, but everyone prepared it just slightly different, you know, and you got a different taste from it or you got a different feel from it. But sharing these experiences for me in watching their faces light up, you know, when they would recall what it was like to have um, their first bit of Chinese, or they, you know, would, would 
like in the case of Joan, would milk a cow or things like that, and, you know, drink the fresh milk, although I had my fresh milk experience and it was very embarrassing for my mother. Um, <laughs> we were in the South and a cousin of hers had freshly milked the cow. And she put it in a regular gallon jug, but it looked very blue. And it was very stringy and stranny. And I go, we're not gonna drink that, are we? And my mother just cut her eyes and I, she says, oh, we're taking it home. And I'm like, of course she poured it down the sink because she wasn't gonna drink it either, even though she had been raised to drink, you know, unpasteurized milk as a kid. But things like that, that, you know, resonated with, there's a coziness about food and cooking that, that happens. Yeah. And if I can just um, add something uh, uh, about the, the project too, I had always intended, and this isn't a plug for my book, but I, uh, this all occurs at the same time. I wrote a book called Lost Restaurants of Sacramento and their recipes, and the publisher and other publishers for years said, we really want you to do Sacramento's restaurant renaissance, which is, to them was really occurring when Chef David Suhu, who's doing a cookbook and others in the 80s were starting to uh, work. And I fought it and I fought it and I fought it. And it wasn't until we started doing this project that I realized that the Renaissance wasn't occurring with the top chefs that had now started going to culinary mm -hmm. schools. Some of them were Michelin starred. Um, they had that kind of background, the 30 fine dining places. Mm -hmm. It really was the mom and pops yes. that were starting to grow uh, in this town. And they are the majority of the, of the restaurants, right. butchers, bakers, mm -hmm. um, Maha Rabada, you know, bakery and others. So that to me is the real change. And that's what we were hoping to do today is to really talk about the real renaissance in Sacramento. Okay. So that segues into kind of, we've talked about other people and you know how they got started, but when and how did you learn to cook? And when you entertain, what are some of the kinds of foods do you prefer to serve? And is it reflective of your culture or you know the culture that you were raised in? And how does it now have a more multicultural bend? And just you know kind of expound on that. So, um so I have to tell you that I learned to cook when I was uh, eight or nine because I thought my parents were such horrible cooks. Remember that, Chung King? <laughs> Pot roast with lima beans. Um, I mean, it was just, they, and I, I'm sure it's true for a lot of people in the audience in here. On certain days, you had spaghetti, right? Monday is spaghetti day. In Sacramento, you could not buy meat. You could only buy fish on Fridays because the Catholic Church had made it impossible uh, to be able to do anything else. So we lived on fish sticks on you know, Fridays. Oh. So the food was pretty horrible. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna really learn how to uh, uh, cook. And, um, and you know, it was the same kind of food, you, no matter whose family you went to. So I started cooking and then I had forgotten that when I started uh, college and that really opened me up, I started to cook professionally. A friend of mine who was German said, we need to earn extra money. So we started making Sunday brunch baskets with fresh muffins, strawberry dipped chocolate, and a little champagne in a, a thing. And we sold them for $35, which I now realize was a That's lot a of lot money. money then, yeah. And no, we didn't sell them to students, by the way, who were. Um, <laughs> And then uh, it's a long evolution. I ended up becoming a caterer, and I won't name them by uh, name, but I will tell you that I, um, I was cooking. Well, well, Phil Eisenberg. I will be okay. honest. Uh, I was doing fundraising for Phil Eisenberg, Isla Collin, uh, Lynn Roby, and others. And I never liked any of the caterers that they had. So one day they said, you're an okay fundraiser, but you're better at organizing volunteers. And also they wanted to be able to have food that represented the community mm -hmm. and not the traditional white food, I guess you would call it, <laughs> from other caterers. So I started looking at, um, and this is something that uh, uh, Joan Didion discovered as well, that Sacramento has this Mediterranean climate and that if we cook the foods that were local to here, uh, which, so I started doing Mediterranean, which for me was Greek and Italian. Um, my husband uh, was, uh, my late husband was an Armenian. Uh, you know, Turkish food from Syria, from Morocco. Mm. And I started using the equipment and the accoutrements so I might, I would have tagines, 
you know, and other stuff because it was so important. What I loved about Indian food was that you could serve it in these wonderful little containers. Mm -hmm. Mexican food the same way. I made sure that the table was always decorated with the claws. I would go to, at the time I had to go to Mexico uh, to get it. Now I can just go to Galt uh, <laughs> to the flea market. But it really was, you know, kind of an evolution. Okay. And I have to say that that's still how I cook. Um, and then I'm going to plug myself. I was the first person in Sacramento to do Bastilla, which was Ooh. filo dough, pigeon pie. Yeah. First one in uh, town to do it. And if you are tired of those lavash roll-ups that you get with the meat in it, I started that. My husband was uh, Armenian. We would buy the lavash cracker. We would spray it with oh. water. We would have to soak it for four hours before it was pliable enough. And I ended up, that was one of my specialties. And then one day, I couldn't get it done in time for a party. And I went to my supplier, which was Safeway. And I said, could you make these instead? And Safeway said, oh, we can actually, you don't have to pre-soak them. You can actually buy the lavash bread. So it all came to you via me and then Safeway. There you go. There you go. So, oh, Kimberly, did you want to talk about your evolution in cooking at all? Yeah, uh, my parents encouraged us to, uh, again, I have uh, five brothers, four older, who, excellent cooks, by the way, um, they got the bug. But when my parents, about the same age as you, tried to teach me, I think my first uh, cooking experience was rice, but I had the attention span of a gnat. So I put the rice on, I washed it thoroughly because that's what we did, washed until all the starch was removed. And I put it on, remember putting the, the heat on and um, turning it down when it boiled. But then I went to watch cartoons. So <laughs> from the kitchen, you could hear, are you cooking? No, because I forgot. So growing up, I didn't do a lot. I dabbled more or less, but it wasn't until I actually got married that I, that clicked and kicked over. So all the foods that I grew up with eating, I presented to um, the husband who had a very minuscule food vocabulary. He'd never had lobster before, so I took him for lunch. And he mortified the two um, women who were sitting next to us at this restaurant that we would frequent in Alameda. And he put Tabasco sauce on because he didn't like drawn butter. And you could hear the gasp from the other table. And I thought, as long as he eats it, who cares? So he graduated from that to lobster thermidor. So he did get better. But um, no, it just sort of, for years, it wasn't until probably a couple years ago that I could actually cook steak before. It was like shoe leather. I don't know what I would do. It didn't matter. My father was an excellent griller, barbecuer. And for whatever reason, I could not save my life if I had to cook a steak. But now, somewhere it clicked over, and I'm much better at it. So I can actually do the rare. I don't care for rare, but I can do it, for those who eat it like that, um, do the medium, and, and so on and so forth. But I, yeah, it's just tons of recipes, and I enjoy being in the kitchen. Although I'm finding that as I get older, and this happened to my mother, I'm losing my edge. You see it in the movies. One of my favorite movies was um, Eat, Drink, Man, Woman. And he lost his edge in the kitchen. And it happens. And you just kind of have to take a step back. And, that, and at that point, that's when I pull out more cookbooks. I'm less experimental. And I don't just like pinch of this, a dash of that, or you know, a taste of this. It's now more like, let me measure it, because it has to come out right. <laughs> Joan, how about you? Well, my mother gave cheese like no one else. More than all of my friends' mothers gave cheese. Her mother gave cheese. Their friends gave cheese. However, they did serve those wonderful butter cookies. Mm -hmm. And of course, they had to have those little pastel bonbons that they ordered from C's. I learned to cook by observing, uh, actually, and later by doing. <laughs> well, that's not true. Uh, as it happens, I was taught to cook uh, by, from, in Louisiana by an 
gentleman who was very good at it. And we were preoccupied with recipes and food. I remember spending whole days with him, with, I call him N, we, perhaps the most pleasant days we ever spent together. He taught me how to fry chicken and how to make brown rice to stuff it in the, the fowl to chop endive with garlic and lemon juice and to lace everything with Tabasco, Worcester, and black pepper. The first present he ever gave me was a uh, garlic press. Well, actually, uh, he had to give me two because I broke the first one. However, one day on the Eastern Shore, we spent hours making shrimp, shrimp bisque. And then we argued about how much salt to put in. Well, he started drinking. And he started putting in all this salt, just to prove a point. Well, it tasted like brine. But it didn't matter. We enjoyed it anyway. You know, um, we were throwing the chicken on the floor, artichokes, buying crab oil discussing endlessly the pro possibilities of artichoke and oyster casserole. You know, after I married, there were days that he'd give me a call. He'd call me, can you see that recipe? <laughs> so having experienced all these regional and international influences from travel, do you eat differently? And where do you eat? So uh, I, I will admit, I live with my brother now, and we probably eat out seven times a week, sometimes two places or three places on the same day. You will, uh, but I do, I will eat a street. So, um, and my passion right now is Freeport Boulevard, I will admit. Uh, and I've gotten addicted to some of the boba uh, spots, mm -hmm. tea, uh, uh, tea licious, the uh, Asian, the izakaya. So, um, I eat out a lot, and then Broadway is so close. It's the one place that I can walk to. And so I have been trying to, on the Broadway, eating at a different place each time, and it's been taking me a, a while. So the last place that I ate was two days ago, and that was at um, Queen Sheba, which is an Ethiopian restaurant that is on Broadway. And. Um, when I cook at home, I have to tell you that I do fall back on nostalgia, and it's, it's uh, for another story, but I didn't find out that I was Jewish until I was 10, and I had to hide that, and I had to hide the foodstuffs mm. that my parents uh, loved to eat. So I find that when I cook, I want to cook what my mother cooked. Remember I told you she was a bad cook? <laughs> now I miss her cooking. Mm. So I want to do potato latkes. Still, my brothers and mine, I think, are the best anywhere. Uh, chicken and dumplings, my mother's meatloaf. It took me 10 years to, pers uh, to get her spaghetti sauce right. And it was because I didn't realize that she used a package of au jus gravy to add a little That's beef flavor. taste wow. to it instead of that tomato taste. So um, Kimberly, again, how about you? So growing up in Oakland, um, it was pretty much a mecca for immigrants. And uh, we had lots of restaurants. And um, I don't know if you may have ever ventured out to what was called the housewives market. Oh, yes. But for us, that was our haven because, again, having southern roots, we made gumbo every year. And we got fresh cracked crab. Um, well, actually, my dad would trek to the city to get that and the dried shrimp from Chinatown and different places like that. So in the downtown area off of Broadway was this housewives market that has now actually been transformed to more of like a food place. It's a local spot. It no longer really has the market itself where you got all of the different types of sausage or fresh meats, fresh fish, which they would actually fry for you at the time. But um, for me, again, my travels and my parents' exposure was what lent itself to what we had at home. So I'd come home one day. I remember a couple of occasions. Um, she bought a walk. She bought everything. If she bought it, she bought everything that went with it, all the gadgets, everything. So we had this fair of, here, try this. And she'd made fried rice and short ribs and various other you know, types of, of foods. Um, but that 
transcended into my, when I attended school and got to know people. I met um, young Filipino friends in elementary school who would invite me to these lavish parties and there's food all the way everywhere and everybody is, you know, it's like being in the South, eat, eat. That's all you would hear and that's all you would do is eat, eat. Um, in college, I got exposed to Ethiopian and Eritrean foods and even Indian foods and for me, very spoiled. I've always had everything prepared in home. So my restaurant experiences stem from what I got firsthand from people that I had met and encountered who my first Ethiopian experience, uh, I can still remember his aunt, his name was Sagai, and he was only here because they were trying to um, save him from having to go to military. He didn't want to be in the war. So he had traveled extensively, wound up here in uh, Alameda at college, and his aunt prepared family-style meal for me. And I can remember going home and doing this because all the spices were, you know, as I perspired from the heat, all the spices were coming through my hands. It was so fragrant to me, you know, where somebody else went, oh, that smells. But for me, it was like, oh, this is beautiful. You know, this is really cool. Uh, before we ask uh, uh, Joan a question, I, I just want to uh, put something in. My father was a very adventuresome eat, uh, eater. And uh, so he would chocolate coat everything so that I would try it. So I had <laughs> chocolate covered ants when I was a kid really? and roaches, you name it. Oh. Uh, we ate Sorry. it and he liked kimchi. And in our oh. neighborhood, I lived very close to our uh, high school. I went to Hiram Johnson High School and kids would walk like as far, they wouldn't go to our street because when he had kimchi, it was so hot that your eyes would literally oh, wow. would, That's pretty. Uh, burn. So I do find that I still love, now I hated it. Now I love kimchi. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go to Banchan and, and, and you know, do Korean. So, Joan. I think you're on the wrong page. No, you, <laughs> not, not at all. You, you say you start your morning with. I start my morning with Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John would make, make sure I ate croissants and uh, jam for breakfast and then a sandwich for lunch. I never, I always, I never ate where I worked. I would eat in the kitchen or in the dining room. You know, I've lived in quite a few places. I lived in New York. I lived in, in Hawaii, Los Angeles. Traveled a fair amount, Miami. It's not international, but Salvador, Vietnam. But when I came home, I cooked my favorite recipes. So can we all talk about our kitchens um, or our mother's kitchens or where we ate in our homes? And one of my favorite Joan Didion quotes is that you were serving lunch to a journalist and set the table with beautiful antique silver. Surprised, the writer asked, you use your good silver for every day? And you replied, Every day is all there is. <laughs> well, my kitchen was my refuge, unlike my mother's kitchen. Oh, man, it was dark and foreboding. The implements that I cooked with were as important to me as the recipes that I saved and collected. You know, in 2017, my nephew, Griffin, actually did a documentary about me. And as a Kickstarter campaign to earn some money, he included some of my recipes, such as borscht, deviled crab, artichokes mm -hmm. au gratin, I like that one, parsley salad made to serve 35 to 40 people, and some desserts like creme caramel and shortcake. You know, I collected friends' recipes too, a cauliflower souffle with brown butter, pulled pork on the bottom of mac and cheese, smudged cocktail. It tell, you know, it, these all tell a story, but in miniature. So I cook on a stove from 1930, and the only reason I'm still able to get, keep it working is thank you, Chef David Suhu. Uh, he actually comes over and fixes my stove so that it's operational. It's the only one who still knows how to use it. It's the same stove, if you've ever heard of uh, Alice Waters from Berkeley, that she has, so nice. and um, I was doing some promotions with her, and I told her we shared the same stove, and she said, uh, I really don't give a, <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> so uh, 
I enlarged my kitchen. Uh, Kimberly has uh, uh, been in it in uh, 1987, so I could entertain and cook in it. And again, I like to entertain using the accoutrement, whatever dish it is. So if I am doing a Moroccan meal, I'll, I'll take, a, I have a brass table sometimes that I yeah. use um, quite a bit. What, one of the things that I was able to buy, and I want to donate some to ACC for a fundraiser, I was able to buy a lot of the lamps, 10 of the lamps from the old coral reef. Remember the lamps that you used oh. to be able to ride on? I've got their bowls, I've got uh, all kinds of stuff from the coral reef. And so I'll oftentimes do my own kind of coral reef uh, party. I, I went to Spain and I picked up cazuela bowls. So if I'm doing Spanish food, I'll use the cazuela bowls. And the other thing that, um, that I love is that I, I like restaurant wear. So mm -hmm. any restaurant that I've ever been in. So if you come over to my house, you might be have, being served silverware that says the Waldorf Astoria right. on it. <laughs> I have um, Robert's Fish Grotto mm -hmm. plates. I have a lot of the stuff from the old Senator Hotel, mm -hmm. the Saddle Rock restaurant. So I try as much as possible to kind of serve that as uh, well. And if you've been in my kitchen and poor Kimberly, I've asked her to help me clean it. Uh, my <laughs> husband has what, 150? I don't even want to count. Uh, oh, maybe 150 kitchen implements that surround that, the room from yeah. every country we've been in and every so instrument. She has a shelf that you could almost constitute as part of the ceiling <laughs> and you literally go around and I go I've got to dust and clean all of that okay but it's beautiful because it adds to the eclecticness of her kitchen and it also demonstrates what type of a cook slash chef that she is because she's actually used a lot of this stuff I've used all of it all of it <laughs> yeah oh my goodness so Kimberly how about you um probably the most notable kitchen that I had was when I lived in Vacaville and we had four acres and we were working on a sustainable housing thing to model so that we could re recreate this in South Africa for one of our projects. I had a uh, four by eight island. My kitchen was pretty much set up feng shui so that literally um, in the island when you walked in you saw my cookbooks on the front there was a place for anyone to sit while I was preparing food. But you'd come in, you'd drop your groceries, they'd go right into the fridge, which is just off to the left. And we had opened it up, so it was an open concept. And in the back, um, the dishware that was exposed with glass cabinets, the dishwasher next to the sink, and I had a warming drawer, and my cooktop was right in the middle of the island. So that way people could see what you were doing. You had plenty of room to demonstrate. And it was just sort of a, a really, truly functional kitchen. And I remember um, we were out one day at several events with regard to food related, and she had a friend with her. And when we got back, the husband had prepared a rack of lamb. Oh, yes. And uh, I forget what the side was that he had made, but they were surprised by that. So, and he is known as chef 30 minutes and I'm chef two days because it takes me longer to prep. But that kitchen was just, you, you want it to be in there and that's what a kitchen should be. It should evoke memories and it should actually provoke cooking. You want to be in there and actually get into, you know, that type of a setting and, and prepare meals and enjoy them. Good. So before we wrap it up, we have a studio audience. I don't know if there's any way of getting questions from, um, from at home. But those of you in the audience, uh, does anyone have a story that you'd like to share, a favorite place that you enjoy going to? Did anyone in the family um, uh, own a farm, own a restaurant, or a bakery where they migrated from? So anyone from the audience? Dale. Um, my family's. Uh so we're going to give you a microphone. Thank you. My family is 100%. Oh, I think 100% Hungarian Jewish. Yeah. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and my one grandmother who lived with us, my mother's mother, sold pastries from the home. So I have her recipes written, scribbled on little index cards, and it'll say 10 cents a piece on the top of it in the little corner. And I still use her, some of her recipes. I still use her breadboard. I still use her um, rolling pin. Um, 
my other grandmother and her husband, my grandfather, who I didn't know very well, um, owned a Hungarian restaurant in Yorkville, which is the Hungarian neighborhood in Manhattan. And then they moved to Pittsburgh and had a restaurant there. She later, after my grandfather died, she worked as a chef in a restaurant in Pittsburgh where the pirates used to hang out. So she was a lifetime Pittsburgh Pirates fan because they were her boys <laughs> who came and she fed them. Um, but I grew up also similar to Mary Ellen, but a little different. I mean, I had my grandmother there who was a great cook as well as a baker. But she went to Florida for two months every winter, as many people do from New York. And so I learned to cook very young. I was about eight, nine years old. And I learned also, as Joan did, by observing. Um, and I, to this day, when I was in college, it was always my apartment where everybody came to eat because <laughs> I would cook for everybody. And when I went to medical school, um, I found out that I was getting invited to everybody's birthday parties because I would bring the cake. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Great. That's awesome. Thank you. Anyone else want to share a story? Back over here. Thank you. Okay, well, I grew up in a small town. In a little the, closer. I grew up in a small town in eastern Washington, and my mother, who was a very plain cook, she didn't have any spices at all in her refrigerator. Salad was a quarter of a iceberg lettuce <laughs> with a little bit of tomato if she was getting risque and hollandaise dressing. So I still remember when I moved to Seattle and was in my young 20s, the first time I had an avocado the first time I had crab, the first time I had sushi. So in some ways, I blessed my mother for allowing me to have this very bland diet and then get really excited about the foods of the world. <laughs> That's it. Great. Anyone else in the audience have a story that they'd like to share? Well, I grew up in the Midwest, and the food is really good, but it's very, very basic and plain. But my father um, started out as a patrolman, and he walked the beat in those days. And there was Mother Cipriani's Spaghetti House. And the only time we went out to eat with any regularity was your birthday. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to go to Mother Cipriani's. Well, my father learned to cook from her. My mother was an awful cook, terrible. My dad was great. And he would work 3 to 11, stop and buy various kinds of ethnic food, and wake me up. I was seven, eight, nine years old. Wake me up. I'd go downstairs and maybe a foot long chili dog or it might be a pizza. And I remember my friends had never heard of pizza, didn't know what it was. I had a pizza party and they were all very scared and weary of what is this thing. So it, he, because of his career, he, he, we too had very ethnic neighborhoods. And um, he would go and learn the people in those areas. And as he climbed in rank, then he would be sure to take the young officers to those restaurants to develop the community. And nowadays, of course, they talk about community policing like it's a whole new concept. But his was always around food. It was always around the restaurants. So I just inherited the love of that. So. Awesome. Great. Anyone else? So uh, before I ask the, the next question, um, as I said, Kimberly and I want to continue to do We Are uh, uh, Where We Eat. You just contributed, so thank you very much. We have, a, those 90 stories are currently on discs that are available at the Sacramento Room of the Public Library and in the different um, uh, 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 historical societies. But we're hoping if we can get some volunteers to transcribe them so that people can actually uh, have experiences with them. And I'm, I'm going to impose on Ted and the group here, I would love to do an occasional story station, not on camera at all, where people can just come in, share their stories, and we capture those stories. Now I have uh, one more question for the audience here and at home, and that is, where do you eat? If you're going to be eating out, um, what's your favorite places? And also, why do you choose it? Do you choose it for the experience, for the taste? 
for the variety, for the servers, whatever. Anybody want to make a comment about that? We're gonna we're gonna put Dale on the spot again. <laughs> for any fancy celebration for me. It's Always crew. Crew. There's no better place in Sa in Sacramento. Yeah. Anyone else? Ted, we can put you on the spot. <laughs> Jade Fountain. Wh where is it? Jade Fountain. Oh, yes. Because we can buy the family dinner and have it for lunch and dinner the next day. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Great. Anybody else? So uh, I am going to tell you a statistic that really upset me. And, uh, and we're going to talk later, a, a little bit later, we're going to wrap it up about the cookbook that we're doing, the ACC Community Cookbook. Taste, which for me is almost the most important, and that's why I like cultural, what I'll call cultural restaurants instead of, uh, well, you refer to it as American food. David Rosengarten said, it's all, the food we've been talking about, every cultural group, it's all American food. And we need to stop talking about, you know, one food it's, it's uh, uh, done. But it really is about taste to me. It's number 10 on a list of 10 for, uh, and the, most people go, believe it or not, for location. They will go to a neighborhood restaurant. They will go to a restaurant like Ted talked about because you can uh, take food home. People will go for the servers. And I, I will say that is true for me. Uh, I don't want to disparage them because I love them still, but Pancake Circus, I've been going to Pancake Circus. <laughs> I won't, I, it starts with a D. I won't say what we used to call it. The food isn't incredible, but I started going in 1960, and there wasn't a time that I'm not greeted by name. I would go in. Now I'm going to out out some of the best chefs in town. You're, you'd see Randall Sell in there, Wayne Tebow, Greg Condos, the, um, the artist would go. Uh, the Mulvaney's. Every chef in town would bring their kids, uh, you know, for there. So uh, it isn't always about taste, I have to say that. And now uh, I want to just thank everybody again for joining us for morning coffee, especially for uh, Joan Didion, who rose from the grave to be here. Thank you so much. I don't look bad from She doesn't look bad at all. And uh, again, what morning coffee is for those people at home is, and, and I broke the coffee pots. So we didn't have good coffee, um, <laughs> but we do have other things here. What are the kinds of conversations that we might just have around the coffee table? Uh, and we have other programs that are going to be coming up on April 21st. David Suhu and I are going to be here. We do have a cookbook that we're working on. Uh, we are looking for volunteers. We're looking for recipes. So if you've got them, it's a chance of being able to celebrate the AAPI uh, community. And um, we're also going to be here on April 22nd for Big Day of Community. I think we might have a slide for that one. The Big Day of Community is on the 22nd from 10 a.m. until 3. And with our group Renaissance Society, we are going to have two projects that will be really fun for family. And one is to create your own book to put your story in. I have incredible decorative papers. Um, I'm donating a, a lot. And, and there's Joan Didion. We'll, we'll go through. So just keep on going through the uh, slides. We just want to keep on going. So keep on going. P pass this. It's slow. Oh, it's slow. So my apologies. <laughs> but we'll be here on the 22nd. And we'll be able to create books using decorative papers for you to put your stories in. And on top of that, uh, we're going to be doing an illustrated recipe. So you can actually illustrate your own uh, recipe for doing it. We have our cookbook. We are expanding the dates um, for the cookbook now. We have till April 15th online, April 30th. So if you have recipes, definitely um, share, them. share them. And you can drop them off here. There is a, a website which if I'm right is accsv.org slash cookbook. And all right, so I've, I've, I've plugged that. I'm trying to think of where uh, else I have to, um, to plug. I think you're good. Oh, you're going to like this, Ted. There is a telethon. I'm going to be here on May 3rd. I am doing a challenge. Uh, so I'm donating a thousand, and I want my friends to uh, be able to match me. 
for being able to do that. Uh, I'm providing food here. I'm encourage other people. I would love to see other people match me at that level, if not. Um, and then on, uh, so, so please give for the big day of giving. You'll be hearing more and more about the incredible stuff that's happening here at ACC. I am so blessed to be uh, um, a part, I'm gonna call it a you're one of us. One of us. I'm now family. Yeah, for being able to do that. And then on June 7th, we, uh, our next morning coffee is also pertinent. Ray Tatter from California Stage will be joined with somebody from uh, most likely Celebration Arts and storytellers on why our stories matter. And it's just so important that the stories that you shared today are actually documented in some way that uh, we know. July 5th, we're doing festivals, festas, and fairs. There are a lot coming up from um, the Portuguese festa, the uh, uh, Japanese ones, uh, the Cortland Pear Fair. So we're gonna go over all the festivals and fairs that are coming up, including some incredible stories and recipes from the California State Fair. I collect a lot of that material. And then on August 2nd, we're doing the Dog Days of August. And that is, it's so hot. We're going to be doing cool drinks and all the foods kind of that come Ooh, with us. Um, and now I'd actually like to turn it over to Joan Didion to end for us. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Join me and the other women of Poverty Ridge when Alter Ego films the tour of my neighborhood. It's going to be sometime in June. Now, I need to read these names because I don't want to miss anybody. Okay. I'll be joined by B publisher Eleanor McClatchy, activist Sally Takeda, Sel Secretary of State March Fong Yu, artist Bertie Boyles, librarian Mabel Gillis, Rebecca Kulat, who just happens to live in the house that Mary Ellen lives in now, uh, plus other women who uh, made their mark in my neighborhood. Now, more information will be listed online with acc.org, so watch for that. But um, this has really been fun. Thank you. And I am so glad that you came today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Great. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Ted and ACC.